Jager Smith is the president of the law firm Jager Smith LLC. His practice is limited to issues related to nuclear power operations. Mr. Smith holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Auburn University and a law degree from Columbia University. He holds three professional engineering licenses and is a member of the U.S. Patent Bar. Mr. Smith represents nuclear plant owners in state and federal forms, including the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, several state public service commissions, and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Mr. Smith regularly participates in international conferences in, held in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. concerning nuclear power operations and nuclear waste disposal, and has been a speaker on various nuclear-related topics at these conferences and elsewhere. Please help me welcome Mr. Jager Smith. You know, you're talking about uh, needing experience to get a job and that sort of thing. And I just relate to you, my experience was that I was uh, on my environmental law journal when I was in law school. And I sort of thought I was going to do that. And I, when I got out of school, I um, sat for the patent bar and I thought, well, I'm going to do that. And then, then I wound up in nuclear power. So you just don't know what you're going to do until you get into it for a while. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about nuclear waste, and I was also asked to talk about uh, nuclear regulation. And I don't know how far I'm going to get, uh, maybe not too very far, because I've got a lot of slides, and, I, and it's a topic that I really enjoy now. What I need to know is, are we going to have questions from the from the floor as we go? Can we do that, or should we hold You're it? You're comfortable with that? Yeah, absolutely. Is that okay with the video? Could we hold off till after your talk, we just sure so we can. have a little? We sure can. Uh, all right. So. Um, Kelly's heard some of this stuff before, I'm sure, so she, if she goes to sleep, I'll understand. Um, um, somebody may be wondering what's on the screen here. Uh, this is your old uh, atomic model, right? And on the right side, it's the newer atomic model. It's an uh, electron density uh, probability distribution for a hydrogen atom. Uh, something we deal with in nuclear power. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, what I'd like to do today, I've got a slide here that kind of, kind of touches on what I want to uh, start out with anyway. Talk about what is nuclear waste, and then we're going to um, talk about classification of nuclear waste. And I'm going to talk about examples of nuclear waste that we have to deal with in the nuclear power industry. And uh, a little bit about fuel reprocessing. And if we have any time left over, I'm going to talk about uh, regulators uh, here and, and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, all of my work today is for Energy Corporation and its nuclear operations. We've got 11 reactors located uh, from Michigan, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, uh, New York, and, and Arkansas, and this, uh, Mississippi and Louisiana. This plant right here is the one that's closest to you. It's the Grand Gulf plant over in Port Gibson. Uh, this is, uh, it started out as a two-unit plant. Uh, that's where Unit 2 would have been. That's the containment building of the reactor for the Unit 1 is, is right in there. Uh, this is, of course, the cooling tower, and I always have to point out that this is a hyperbolic cooling tower. It's got the hyperbolic shape, and everybody associates the hyperbolic tower with nuclear plants, but that's not necessarily true. There are plenty of fossil plants and other industrial uses that use hyperbolic cooling towers, and we have a number of nuclear plants that don't have hyperbolic towers at all. So um, don't think that that's, uh, that means that's a nuclear plant. In fact, I wrote an article for some publication, an ABA publication. Did you make me do that? No, but I remember that. They yeah. put the wrong. They, they put a, uh, they, when it came out in a published form, they put a picture with it, and it was a fossil plant mm -hmm. with a, a hyperbolic tower on it. Holy smoke, I hope they don't think that I'm not smart enough to know what a, a fossil plant looks like mm -hmm. from a nuclear plant. No, the article was about nuclear power. Um, just to give you an idea of what's inside these places, this is a, a picture, a panoramic picture of inside the Pilgrim Nuclear Station. Um, I think this is an interesting picture. Uh, if any of you saw the explosion that happened at the Fukushima event, this is the same general design of the plant uh, that was involved in the Fukushima reactors. And if you saw that picture of the explosion from far away, that was actually this building, which is a, basically a metal building exploding. Uh, hydrogen had collected in this building and it, some ignition source set it off. Um, it, but here are, this is a, a reactor vessel head detentioner and other, there's 
tools for spent fuel and, and uh, equipment lay down. Right here is a, um, in this circular area here is big concrete plugs that we lift up to get to the reactor, which is located below. But in the Fukushima event, um, the fuel had become exposed and the zirconium cladding on the fuel had started to oxidize, which liberates uh, hydrogen and then it leaked up into this building and it blew up. So it, it looked a lot worse than it was. Uh, in the United States and elsewhere, this map uh, shows uh, countries that are, are using nuclear power. Uh, the green countries uh, here are um, established nuclear power, or actually uh, expanding nuclear power. Uh, the blue countries are kind of stable in nuclear power, and then the, um, the, the rest either don't have it or are, are decommissioning, uh, cutting back on the nuclear power. Um, France has got about 70% of its um, power requirements met by nuclear power. We've got about 20% of our electricity generation in the United States is nuclear. We've got 100 reactors. Well, we've got, a, we've announced the closure of the Vermont Yankee Station. Within a year or two, there'll be 100 nuclear power reactors in the United States. And there's a couple of stations that are actually being built right now. Um, what is nuclear waste? Um, that's actually a, sort of a philosophical question, although I don't have time to talk about the philosophy about it. The, um, when uh, Kelly contacted me about speaking to you today, uh, I was in a conference in Belgium, and there was one of the speakers that had just spoken about, you know, is nuclear waste really waste? Because the concept is, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we're spending billions of dollars to try to put away so it can never be touched again has um, certainly potential value uh, in the future for somebody to use. But um, nevertheless, uh, what I'm going to define nuclear power and nuclear waste today as things that radioactive material that no longer has any uh, use for productive purposes right now. Uh, some of the examples of uh, nuclear waste or consumables that we use at nuclear power plants, which is uh, protective clothing, for example, uh, gloves uh, over, over clothes that go on the outside of your clothes, um, filters uh, that have to be replaced to filter some sort of uh, con radioactively contaminated stream. Um, when we have to replace equipment, um, if it's been contaminated with radioactivity, it becomes nuclear waste. Uh, fuel tailings is the, the back end uh, part of the nuclear fuel production cycle, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we, in the United States, our uh, nuclear fuel is enriched in the uranium uh, isotope U-235 more than what you get out of it when you mine it in the ground. So we have to increase the concentration for our, our fuel product, but that leaves tailings that have less of a concentration that can become nuclear waste. And then, of course, you probably have heard of spent nuclear fuel. I'll talk more about that. And then decommissioning waste, if you take down a nuclear plant, contaminated structures and other parts of the plant uh, may be uh, radioactive and have to be dealt with. But I should point out that although my focus is on nuclear power production, uh, there are plenty of other sources of radioactive waste in the United States. Medical is the first one that jumps to mind. Um, there are, if you go get chemotherapy, somebody's got to run a reactor somewhere, typically, to produce medical isotopes. And the running of that reactor will create some uh, nuclear waste. Uh, this is a picture of a gamma knife machine, which is a pretty interesting um, delivery source for radiation. It uses a cobalt-60 source. And that cobalt-60 source is good for about, the half-life on cobalt-60 is, I believe, about five and a half years. So after a period of time, that cobalt is going to, the gamma radiation from the cobalt is going to decrease, and it's got to be replaced, and something's got to be done with that cobalt source, as well as anything that's been sitting next to it that may have uh, become radioactive by virtue of having sat there. Um, and here's, a, here's another, there's plenty of other examples, but I find this one to be interesting. Some of you may have a, a, a blue topaz. If it's very blue, it's probably been irradiated. Uh, they irradiate the topaz to make it bluer, and it, which has been 
uh, actually kind of a controversy in the United States because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is supposed to uh, regulate irradiation of gemstones, but they're coming in from outside the country. Um, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is a little concerned that they don't have proper control over that. But something you might not know, there's plenty of other uses for um, radiation in a lot of industrial processes. And so you, you might be surprised at other places that create nuclear waste. Now, in the United States, waste is classified under a scheme that's set out in 10 CFR uh, 61.55. And it's a, uh, it's, we classify waste based on the Curie content of the waste. And a Curie is a measure of radioactivity. You've heard of Madame Curie, who was involved in um, early experiments with radiation. Um, so the Curie content of Curies per cubic meter will be measured and we classify the waste and the classification and the particular isotopes that are in the waste stream uh, dictate how this stuff has got to be handled and disposed of. In the United States we have uh, class A waste which is uh, very lowest classification. Uh, this would be, uh, examples would be like the uh, protective clothing that I mentioned that we use when we go in the nuclear plant. Uh, class B is higher, class C is higher than that, of course. And then GTCC is greater than class C waste, <laughs> which there's very little of that. And typically, the greater than class C waste is uh, certain instrumentation that sits right inside the nuclear reaction, inside the reactor for a long time, as well as certain parts of the reactor vessel. Uh, and I'd love to talk about that, but we don't have enough time to go into it the configuration of that. The next thing is, is high level waste. Typically that is um, sp spent fuel. Um, it is very radioactive and has to be uh, put aside for a very long time in a very safe configuration. And this is just a, a little clip out of uh, 6155 and um, you see it's got different isotopes. H3 is tritium, uh, three hydrogen atoms cobalt 60, nickel 63, et cetera. And if, it's, uh, if the curing content is less than column one, it's class A, and if it's between one and two, it's B, and so forth. Uh, but that's the, the grading scheme for these materials. Now, outside the United States, there's no uniform standard. I have no idea what they do in places like Iran. Um, there are places, uh, I've got friends that are working over in the United Arab Emirates. The, the Emirates are trying to establish a new nuclear power uh, production program. Why, I don't know if you're sitting on a lot of oil. But, uh, maybe UAE is not sitting on a lot of oil, I don't know. But they're trying to develop a, a regulatory scheme over there. And they would be, UAE would be probably, because my friends are working on it, they're probably going to follow the U.S. model. But other countries use uh, a classification scheme that's been uh, developed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And they use these classifications, uh, exempt waste, which I think is, and I don't practice overseas, so I'm telling you something secondhand here, but exempt waste, I believe, doesn't have any radioactivity content. And then it goes up from there. And their high level waste would also correspond to our spent fuel waste. Uh, here's just some pictures of uh, some things that would be radioactive waste. Um, you go in the nuclear plant, you see these um, containers. Uh, around if you've got something that you've got contamination, radioactive contamination on, uh, you put it in there. Uh, when we go into contaminated areas, um, we've got to put these uh, kind of suits on. This is not the ones that we use at Entergy, but um, you have to sit there and pull on these kind of socks over your shoes, and then you have to put booties over the socks, and you have to get into this outfit, and you have two pair of gloves on and then you duct tape your ankles and you duct tape your sleeves and um, wear all this stuff. The, the problem is that contamination is like dust. It's not radiation. Contamination is a little bit different thing. It's like dust that has radioactivity in it. And you don't want to carry any of that out of the plant. They will not let you. In fact, if you've got, when you go inside the radiologically controlled area of the plant, you have to go through radiation monitors, and when you come out, you go through radiation monitors again. Whole body counters that you have to get into, and they read the radiation. 
So you better tell them if you type in uh, chemotherapy or anything like that or else you're going to get stuck there because it's not going to go away. But most often when I go in the nuclear plant, we don't have to wear the protective clothing. Um, I take tours um, through the plants from time to time. And when we go into areas that don't require PCs, I have to caution everybody, first off, don't wear a tie, don't wear anything synthetic. Most of the time, what's going to get you uh, get radiation stuck to you is radioactive gases like radon or iodine. Which, you, if you've got a brick house, you've got radon at your house, and so you probably couldn't get out of your house if we use the same standards that we apply at the nuclear plants. But uh, if you've gotten, um, we call it gassed up, if you've gotten iodine gas on you, you basically have to wait at the exit portal until the iodine either decays a natural decay or until it blows off. I mean, you sit in front of a fan until it blows off. <laughs> and in, in one case, um, some time back, uh, one of the folks I brought through the plant had to give up his pants. <laughs> so, and they give you some paper scrubs to wear at home. Um, here's, uh, and this is just bagged up waste. When these guys take this stuff off, you put it in the, in the bags. And sometimes we'll recycle it but most often we have to dispose of it as radioactive waste. And here's a heat exchanger. That one actually is coming new out of the box, but if we replace that one, the, the old one would be radioactive waste. Um, other examples are components inside a reactor vessel. Uh, this would be a, a plate that uh, nuclear fuel assemblies might sit on. This is the top section of a, of a reactor inside a reactor, a pressurized water reactor system. Um, these are great. These things will sit very close to the reaction and may become highly radioactive, and so they're likely to be classified as GTCC waste or greater than class C waste. Um, some of the demineralizer resins, uh, that's a, a kind of a filter media that we use to clean the water uh, that's used in the uh, nuclear reaction process, and it will pick up uh, a lot of radioactivity. Um, here's, I, I talked about the back end of the fuel cycle. Um, when we mine uranium oxides, we have to convert them into uranium hexafluoride. And the reason for that is because you have to separate the isotopes, the, the U-235 and the U-238, because I'm trying to concentrate the U-235. And you have to put it in a chemical form that somehow you can discriminate between heavier molecules and lighter molecules. Uh, the thing about uh, fluorine is it's only got one isotope, so it's always the same weight. And so if I'm making uranium hexafluoride, then I can I have a standard material connected to a uranium isotope that has different weights, and I can use a uh, centrifuge or some other methodology to preferentially screen out the U-235 heard about the Iranian centrifuges possibly in the news that uh, we actually, somebody blew them up not too long ago with a computer bug. Um, that was what they were doing was sorting out the, the uranium isotopes in that, in that centrifuge process. But anyway, at the end of the process, you wind up with uh, tanks of if uranium hexafluoride at normal temperatures and pressures as a gas. And so you wind up with this gaseous substance that we put in these tanks that uh, has very little of the U-235 in it. It's got mostly U-238 in it. Um, but uh, it's stored. We do use this stuff for some things. Uh, this is what we call depleted uranium, and the military will use this to make uh, high-density uh, munitions that have very great penetrating power. And we also use uh, depleted uranium for uh, armor plating, for example, our tanks will have um, uh, depleted uranium armor on them, which is very hard to penetrate with conventional weapons. Um, talk about nuclear fuel just a little bit. Uh, nuclear fuel comes in uh, what we call assemblies. These guys are uh, working on uh, an assembly there. They're inspecting it. This one uh, is it's fresh fuel. It's never been irradiated. Only after fuel has been irradiated does it become dangerous radioactivity-wise. I was in court not too long ago um, explaining to a judge setting up for a case we were working on 
and I had uh, I had some pictures about that had this kind of uh, fuel, and I was trying to explain to the judge, here's what nuclear fuel looks like, and he asked the question, well, how do you know that's no fuel and not used fuel? And the answer is because the guys aren't dead. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, once it's irradiated, it's, it's kept underwater for a very long time. I'll show you some pictures of the pillars. Uh, the, the, the fuel is actually in the in pellets that's included in uh, zirconium alloy tubes. We use zirconium alloy because it's got pretty good metallurgical process, uh, properties, but it also is quite transparent to radiation. So if you use, for example, lead tubes, lead is a pretty good shield for radiation, and uh, that wouldn't do you any good. So you want to use a material that has fair, fairly good radiation transparency. Now, if I showed you a block of zirconium and a block of lead and a block of some other metal, you might be able to tell the difference, but they have different uh, properties with respect to radiation transmission. Uh, here's another uh, fellow inspecting some fuel for us. We get this fuel in, in uh, crates, and um, the reactors have between 177 or so to 800 of these assemblies in them. Assemblies are about up to uh, maybe 15 feet long. And they have very um, enrichments of uh, uranium in these tubes. And I will point out that we use uh, no more than 5%. We're limited by regulations to no more than 5% U-235 in our fuel. If you wanted to make a weapon out of that, you'd have to get closer to 100%. So there's no such a ability at a nuclear plant to have an explosion like you would see at, uh, like from Hiroshima or Nagasaki. We just, it's impossible physically. Here is a, um, a picture of a spent fuel pool. Um, once the fuel has become irradiated, we transfer it underwater at all times, and we put it in racks in, this, these, um, in pools at our plants. The pools are about 40 feet deep. They are very misleading. Uh, it looks like the water's, there's about five feet of water before you get to the fuel. In fact, there's 20 plus feet of water. It's pretty clear usually. And um, when you look at them, the pools are usually smaller than this room. But you stand on one side and you look at the, at the down in the racks and there's an optical illusion that I find to be interesting. It looks like the racks are going uphill. And then you go on the other side of the pool and they look like they're going the other way. So, um, but uh, we keep it in very deep water that's cooled with um, heat exchangers. Water is a very good um, radiation blocker. Very, very good. And so, uh, I don't have any problems standing around this fuel, but if you pick, took, took a crane and pick that fuel up out of the water, you'd cause some serious personal damage. Um, the blue, I would point out, um, it's what's called Sherenkov radiation. And it's a phenomenon that happens when radiation comes out of the fuel and it's, uh, it's traveling at a, a speed that's higher than the speed of light in the medium in which it's in. Uh, and it doesn't go for very far, but uh, if you were able to look inside a reactor, you'd see the screaming blue color. The whole thing would just be this blue color. When we open up the reactor, it's got this blue color. That dissipates fairly quickly. Frankly, I don't know where, where I got this picture, but uh, it, uh, that's a lot of blue coming off. So I'm, there must be some uh, kind of special photography because you usually can't see that much blue coming off of it. And this is uh, an, uh, one of the spent fuel pools at A&O. Uh, you can see the racks down there. And after the fuel has sat in the uh, spent fuel pool for a period of time, at least five years, uh, it's cooled off enough radiation-wise radiation and thermally to where we can move it to dry cask storage. Um, these are dry casks. Uh, these are um, assemblies that are actually at A&O today. Um, uh, just 
picture with uh, this friend of mine uh, standing there acting like he's doing something. I don't think he is. I think he's really just providing scale for this picture. <laughs> but these uh, casts are about 20 feet tall and, I don't know, eight or nine feet in diameter. And they're heavily shielded with about two feet of concrete and steel. Uh, a shell, and on the inside is a canister, and I've got a picture in a moment, I'll show you the canisters. Uh, I wouldn't have any problem standing there in front of them. The shielding on them is, is quite good. Um, this is our Indian Point plant in New York, and we're moving uh, a, can a cask to, from the reactor building to a place where we can park it. Now, we wouldn't have to be doing this if the Department of Energy had picked our spent fuel up, uh, which is one of, the, one of the things that I spend most of my time on is suing the federal government for not picking our spent fuel up. We all signed contracts back in 1983 about 83, 83 to 86, it depends on when you, where you were at the time, uh, where we pay the Department of Energy to pick our spent fuel up and they were to start picking it up not later than January 31st, 1998. So 15 and a half years later, they haven't picked anything up and the current administration has actually canceled the Yucca Mountain Project, uh, which is, in a word, to me, outrageous. but. Um, Part of my job is to sue the government for the cost that we now have to incur to store the stuff that the government should have been taken care of. And uh, we've gotten thus far a couple hundred million dollars in judgments, and uh, I've got uh, cases for every one of our reactors going forward. Uh, I didn't mention these. Uh, maybe I didn't mention these casks. Once they're loaded up, <coughs> weigh about 200 tons. So um, it's a very, very heavy piece of uh, hardware. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture actually of a, a different, this is a horizontal cast system and we use that at Palisades. I've got a picture of that coming up. But this just shows you the uh, external uh, shielding and then there's an internal canister and there's a basket that's included inside of that that the nuclear fuel is located in. This, particular assembly goes in a kind of a horizontal mausoleum. Uh, now, what I wanted to show here is not just a black screen, but um, I have some testing that's been done on these casks, so hopefully this will work. We're about to find out. Anybody have any ideas how to make the I think we're not going to watch the film. What I had there was, um, um, and I'm sorry that that doesn't play, but I have, it's testing of film uh, that was done by Sandia National Laboratories showing the testing of these casks being transported. And they hook rocket engines to uh, locomotives and uh, semi-trucks and they launch these um, a railroad car or something and smash into the canisters and they uh, run them into concrete walls and of course they bounce off and land on the ground and then they set them on fire uh, and i want to see that video yeah I, 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 we can show that later i don't know what the problem is here but um i show that to the courts to show that these are very robust pieces of equipment of course, these casks cost about, well, a little over a million dollars a piece. And I can put between 32 and 24 assemblies in one kind of them and up to 64 in another kind. So they don't hold that many assemblies and they're very expensive. This is our moving some spent fuel and other transportation mains at our Palisades plant. And here again is a palisade. You see, we stack them up, uh, waiting for the government to do its job. <laughs> uh, this is our Vermont Yankee plant. I had to put this picture in there because I'm in it. <laughs> um, uh, with uh, some Department of Justice people that uh, I'm 
them. So, so they always want to go. <laughs> they always want to go see the uh, the stuff that I'm making them pay for. <laughs> uh, this is our uh, some horizontal modules there. Uh, at Pal also at Palisades, and we we slide the uh, the canisters in those horizontally. We're actually going to stop using those and move to the vertical ones at that plant. Not too long from now. Now, another kind of waste, well, I'm moving away from spent fuel now, is uh, decommissioning waste. When we take a plant down, um, we have to cut pieces of it up that are radioactive and do something with them. This is a, a picture I, I got from a presentation that was done at the conference that I mentioned earlier. This is uh, at the Jose Cabrera nuclear plant in Spain. And this is the reactor vessel, uh, and they got the got an underwater cutting apparatus that cuts that vessel up into small pieces and puts it in a container over here and this container is ultimately loaded into various kinds of casks to be buried in a repository or wherever it needs to go depending on the radiation level of the material. All of this work is done underwater uh, which makes it an interesting task to do. It's done with remote cameras and uh, underwater cutter cutting equipment. Um, this is a, a containment building or a shield building uh, for at the main Yankee plant. It was in Maine. And um, you see a uh, conventional demolition work is being done. They're using a jackhammer here. You have a fellow over here who's just spraying water on the concrete to keep it from uh, dust from going anywhere. The radiation levels on this containment structure would be very, very low. In fact, uh, any radiation would probably be limited to the inside liner. These uh, containment buildings at nuclear plants consist of a very thick, I say thick, it could be one to two inch thick steel liner followed by several feet of uh, concrete and uh, reinforcement steel. And it's very difficult to tear them down. These things are designed to withstand um, various kinds of missiles and uh, chiefly um, would be an aircraft impact. If somebody tried to fly, on a, uh, like we had the 9-11 impacts, if they wanted to fly one into a nuclear plant containment, it would have made a lot of smoke and dust. But it probably wouldn't have gone through the, uh, through the containment. It's just too rigid. Now, um, with respect to rag waste handling across the world, um, we generally are all going in the same direction. Uh, lower level radioactive waste is uh, disposed of in shallow landfills. Uh, most countries are either uh, well underway in developing a, a mined geological repository uh, like we were doing until Yucca Mountain got shut down where spent fuel would be located and um, here I just mentioned that there are several different approaches to repositories. The Yucca Mountain uh, repository would be in a rock formation called Tuff. Uh, you may have heard something about the salt domes in Mississippi uh, where the, there was some talk about using the salt domes for a, a nuclear waste repository. I don't personally prefer salt for that purpose. The problem with salt in my mind is that the salt will melt. And so whatever you, if it's got heat source to it, you put it in there and the salt will melt around it and enclose it, uh, which is not the same phenomenon you have at the, in the rock repositories. Other uh, countries are using, uh, they put it down in, in deep clay formations. This is a picture from, uh, I guess, our newest radioactive waste disposal facility that's been built in the United States in Andrews County, Texas, uh, which will take, I guess it's, is it licensed for B and C? I think it is licensed for B and C. Do you know that? Um, um, I think it is, for A, B, and C class waste. But you see where they, they developed these uh, engineered pits uh, where the waste will be in place and then it will be covered over. And it's got, they've got liners and so forth to control any water sources. Um, 
And here is a, another picture of the Andrews County, one of those uh, pits. And just for some perspective, you got a couple of people down here in the bottom of this pit. Now, there is another approach, and we do in the nuclear power industry use some of this, and that is re uh, re uh, processing of waste. Uh, primarily, we're trying to reduce the volume of it so that uh, you've got a, a bag of class A waste, we can uh, cut it down to a very small amount. And one of the ways we do that is to incinerate it. And that's a very controlled incineration process. It's not like taking it in your backyard with the leaves and setting it on fire. Uh, it's in a, an enclosed incinerator. Basically, the point is to convert it into ash. Incineration will do nothing to the isotopic concentrations. That doesn't affect the radioactivity or the constituent radioactive elements. Uh, to change that, you'd have to put it in some sort of reactor but it does reduce the volume. And other means that we use are, uh, this is a compaction, that's physical compaction. Uh, vitrification is another, and this is a, a vitrification canister where we put silica in with certain types of waste and heat it up until it forms glass. The benefit of that is you can put it somewhere and don't have to worry about water leaching anything out uh, into some other, in a, into an aquifer or anything. And this is a, oops, this is a uh, cement process. I mentioned here uh, bioremediation. The government has done some of that at some of its uh, waste sites like Hanford, where uh, nuclear testing and nuclear weapons have been uh, developed. And you basically use uh, biological organisms to, to change the, the waste structure in one way or another. We don't do any of that in the commercial industry. I uh, talked some about the Yucca Mountain Repository. Here's where it is in southern uh, Nevada. And uh, we've not been able to establish a repository there. We did above ground nuclear tests in this area in the World War II time frame. Nobody lives there. It's a desert in the bottom of a mountain and we can't figure out where to put the nuclear fuel. Now, where are we going to put it? <laughs> Nowhere, right? Uh, we're just going to leave it where it is, I suppose, uh, until Harry Reid is gone. <laughs> and then we'll maybe be able to move on. Um, this is a, another diagram of the, of the Yucca Mountain <laughs> facility. And I don't mean to, to express any political opinions here, right? Um, it, we would take the, the fuel canisters down into these, what are called uh, drifts, is what I call them, and, and, and place them there, um, and eventually seal up the facility. I'm not really sure why we want to do that. Uh, the materials in here could potentially have some use. Um, we ass the assumption is that everybody's going to revert to cavemen, and we have to put this thing where nobody could get to it if they wanted to, uh, which I don't think is very smart. History, recorded history, shows us getting smarter over time, mm -hmm. not stupider. <laughs> so why would you want to assume that, that future generations are not smart enough to know to leave this stuff alone? I'm not sure. Um, here's a, a schematic of, of how the tunnels would have the uh, the material located in them. Uh, this is the entrance to the Yucca Mountain facility, and uh, here is the only uh, beneficial use of what we've done out there, and that is train rides. <laughs> uh, everybody has been out there and toured the thing. So, and uh, don't worry about this. This is too much on the slide, but. Um, this is some facts about uh, Yucca Mountain. We've, so far, the DOE has spent $11 billion studying the Yucca Mountain site. Uh, we have, the industry, the nuclear industry, has paid in, uh, through 2012, about $24 billion for nuclear waste fees that you'll pay a little bitty piece of that on your electric bill. Um, and for energy plants, um, we have, our share is about 10% of that. Um, 
And again, they were supposed to start picking our fuel up in 1998. Uh, another way to deal with fuel is to reprocess it. Uh, other than some military reprocessing, uh, there's no reprocessing going on in the United States. In reprocessing, what we do is we remove fission products out of the fuel and harvest the usable uh, uranium-235 and uh, a couple of plutonium isotopes that could, could be used again for fuel. Uh, because in fact, after you run fuel through the reactor for five, six years, it still has probably more than half the usable fuel still available in it. The problem is it's got a lot of what are called fission products. Once the uranium atoms break into pieces, they break into other elements that it's all contained within that tiny fuel capsule. It doesn't come out, but it, these other fission products capture neutrons and slow the nuclear reaction down, so you have to get them out. Um, and, but the reprocessed material is called mixed oxide. Uh, we've got some plant designs in the United States that are licensed to burn mixed oxide fuel, but since mixed oxide fuel has plutonium in it, uh, it requires a little bit different handling, and we at Entergy don't use any mixed oxide fuel. Um, a little bit of history on reprocessing. Uh, President Carter banned it in 1977. Because you're disassembling the fuel and chemically uh, taking down the material uh, and collecting plutonium, I guess that there was a concern about nuclear weapons proliferation. And so uh, he banned the process. President Reagan lifted the ban four years later. But again, we really don't have any uh, reprocessing going on in the United States because it's, it's cheap enough to get fresh uranium, if you will, out of the ground rather than have to go through this process. Uh, other countries are reprocessing. Here are some examples listed. This is the Thorpe processing plant in uh, Southfield in the United Kingdom. And it looks like a fairly complicated operation, and it is. It's a very expensive plant. Um, and it produces uh, quite a bit of, uh, shall we say, difficult radioactive problems to deal with because you're pulling out a lot of radioactive material that you have to do something with. How's my time look? Am I, am I burning through all my time? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, I'm, I'm getting closer to where, where I'm going to stop. But, um, I was asked to speak a little bit about regulators. Um, in the United States, we're regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, other countries, other, other major nuclear countries have similar regulators, but they all have some differences. France has got the Autorité du Sûreté Nucléaire, and uh, Germany's got the Umfeld, Bundesamt, uh, China Atomic Energy Authority, and so forth, all have regulatory schemes. Now, there are some differences, and some of the differences in the uh, Japanese regulation was exposed by the Fukushima event. Uh, our plants have had regulatory requirements that would have uh, put our plants in better stead if they had um, encountered the same event that the Fukushima plants uh, had to deal with. And of course, even after that, we are going through uh, considerable revisions. Even now, the NRC has put out several orders that are requiring us to strengthen the uh, safety of our nuclear plants throughout the United States, which is going to be a very costly enterprise. One can debate about whether it's a good idea, but um, that's what we're doing. Uh, there are other nuclear organizations that we um, interface with from time to time. I mentioned earlier the uh, IAEA. You've probably heard of them. They'll oftentimes go in and do inspections uh, in Iran and elsewhere where there's problems. Um, they do publish standards and they are of great help to lesser developed nuclear countries in the world. Um, and then there's the Nuclear Energy Agency. We don't do a whole lot with them. The World Association of Nuclear Operators, or WANO, we do uh, work with them a fair amount. Uh, one of the chief benefits of having 
civilian agencies like this is the promulgation of uh, what we call operating experience. So that if some event happens in a plant in France, we can get a report about it and look and see if, if we've got a similar situation that might cause us to need to do something about it. Um, a quick look at, at the uh, hierarchy of nuclear regulation in the United States. The Atomic Energy Act of 1954 is the uh, basic regulation. Um, we started out, by the way, with the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, I, thinking about the 1954 time frame, and at some point, and I'm not sure when it was, we broke the AEC into two organizations because it was believed that the AEC uh, was had a conflicting job requirement. They were charged with promoting the peaceful, peaceful use of nuclear power, and they were also charged with regulating it. So you've got somebody promoting and regulating the same thing was a, a conflict. So they split it out and created the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is now a regulator in the Department of Energy turned into the promoter. Uh, anyway, we've got the, the organic statute there, that uh, Atomic Energy Act, and uh, our regulations are found in the uh, Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations. It's uh, a couple of volumes of the CFR. And, and then the NRC promulgates uh, all kinds of other uh, requirements below that, orders and regulatory guidance and so forth. Uh, and part of the thing that we lawyers have to deal with is when an NRC staff member says you have to do X and X is in the guidance but it's not in the regulation or it conflicts with the regulation then we have to resolve well what do we really have to do because um, we, we're legally bound uh, by the regulations and, and by the law. If the, if the regulations conflict with the law, you know how that resolves, right? The, the law wins. Uh, here's a, a snapshot of the organizational structure of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, it's got five commissioners. Uh, you can have no more than three from one party. So right now we've got two Republicans and three Democrats. Um, typically, these people are very uh, fair people, and uh, they're usually very smart people. And we don't too often have a problem with uh, somebody with a political ax to grind. The chairman before the chairman we have now was a bit of an exception to that. But um, even then, that problem doesn't necessarily permeate down to the staff level. We deal with the staff levels, and the staff people are, are below this chart. Um, and they're the ones we usually have to negotiate with and deal with the day-to-day -day issues about our nuclear plant. This picture just gives you some idea of, of how they're set up. Um, they've got right now about 4,000 employees. Um, there are resident inspectors that their job is to go to our nuclear plants. This is a picture our Indian Point plant right here. We've got two or three resident inspectors there. So the nuclear regulator is on site every day watching what you're doing. Um, and then from time to time they bring in special inspections and, and all kinds of other uh, uh, looks at what we're doing. And of course we are constantly making reports to them about one thing or another, which is another big task for the lawyers. Uh, and the, this just shows that the NRC is broken into regions. Uh, we have our plants, uh, we've got plants in Region 4, and we've got one plant in Region 3 and one in Region 1. Um, not much interesting other than that about that. And that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say, and I, I'm shocked that I got through it as quickly. I had to restrain myself from telling you all kinds of stories that I would like to tell. Uh, anybody have any questions about anything? I'll ask a question. Yeah. Uh, does Entergy have research facilities where they can just conduct general scientific research or nuclear research? And if so, is that 
get any kind of funding from the federal government through grants and whatnot? Yeah, we don't do any uh, any kind of general research. I will say that I have several uh, engineer friends who are always inventing one thing or another uh, because of their work, and there are several notable examples of guys that are kind of inventing things on, in their job to solve various problems, but we don't do any large-scale research. We uh, are involved in uh, groups called like the Electric Power Research Institute and the Nuclear Energy Institute, primarily the Electric Power Research Institute, where uh, research is done and we can share the cost of that with other um, utilities so that we can actually go ask for something to be done, but we only pay a fraction of the cost because everybody else would be interested in that as well. And we use EPRI a lot on the water side because for the for the nuclear plants, as you can imagine, they intake a lot of water, so they have a 316B, Clean Water Act 316B ramifications, and we've used EPRI to help us on a national scale to figure out, you know, what are the best technologies at certain facilities. Trade Association. Please. Is it is it true that it's no longer safe to eat Pacific fish since the Fukushima reactor? Is that like a internet rumor? Going that on? sounds. Um, like a room to me. Snopes hasn't answered that one for me yet. But yeah, the, the amount of radiation that's been dumped into the sea at the Fukushima location is uh, the proverbial drop in a bucket. And I would also point out that um, if we run out of easily accessible land sources for mining uranium, we're going to strain seawater for it because seawater is, is a major place to, to get uranium. Hmm. So that sounds bogus to me. Hmm. There's, there's a whole lot of rumor out there when it comes to nuclear plants. Jager, can you talk for a minute about tritium because that was a hot hot issue with a lot of the facilities and the tritium that leaks into the groundwater yeah. and then just how common tritium is in our yeah, tritium, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, tritium is, a, is H3. It's uh, three hydrogen atoms. And uh, it will, I'm sorry, it's not three hydrogen atoms. It's a, it's, a, it's a hydrogen atom with atomic weight of three, one proton and two neutrons. And it will form water or tritiated water with two H3 atoms and an oxygen atom. Atom, H2O. Uh, it is a product of our nuclear operations. We will create tritium in our reactors. Um, and as Kelly notes, there have been instances where it has leaked out and gone into the ground um, around our plants. I think there's a lot of hype about tritium. Tritium is used, and I've pointed out elsewhere that tritium is used in uh, glow-in-the-dark exit signs and you don't have one here but you've seen them green they're in the movie theaters and such and they stay glowing even if you don't shine any light on them it's not like uh, phosphorus it stays glowing because it's got a, a very low-grade um, radioactive isotope in it if you break one of those signs open and release the tritium you will release way more tritium than we ever have spilled in our nuclear plants. Um, but people have gone nuts about it. It's got a, about a 12.7 year half-life, which means after 12.7 years, half of it is going to be gone. Those signs eventually will, will fade out and you have to replace them, by the way. But when it decays, it decays to helium. And it's a, non, it's a stable or non-radioactive form of helium. And the thing that's most important about tritium is the radiation that it emits is beta. It's a, a low, uh, low energy beta particle, which is an electron in other particles. But the beta radiation will not penetrate your skin. So the only way to hurt yourself with it is to ingest it. And but people say, well, it's getting into the groundwater and it goes into drinking wells and so forth. Um, I don't, it's not nearly the problem that people have made it out to be, um, but we've gotten in 
a lot of nuclear plants have gotten in a lot of hot water with their public uh, constituents by virtue of having tritium leaks. Um, I think we've had a leak at Grand Gulf. I think we've stopped that. We may have spilled something. But it's really um, overhyped mm -hmm. in my humble estimation. Um, I've threatened to go to one of these uh, regulatory meetings and uh, drink a glass of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the drinking water standard is, uh, I think, 20,000 picocuries per liter. It's a pretty high uh, amount that the EPA allows you to have in drinking water mm -hmm. because it's just not very harmful. And so, uh, I have a few questions for you. You know how there was a moratorium, at least in Italy, though that was tied to some other uh, legal issues, like nuclear the nuclear construction. Or I, th I think of nuclear uh, nuclear power plants. Like they they put a moratorium on it in Italy, but they tied it to privatization of water issues. But in Germany, isn't there an issue going on right now with some sort of leakage? Have you heard anything about that? I don't know. Germany has waffled about whether they were going to go keep their plants open or not. And they had gone back to, well, we're going to keep them open. And after Fukushima, they decided, well, now we're going to close them down after so many years. I'm not familiar with the particular leak issue there. Who are the main, so, so in the, if a lot of the stuff is just coming from various activist sources, I'm guessing, that are well-meaning or benevolent but maybe don't understand the the science behind it or sort of looking at some sort of risk assessment that you know I, I don't know of or something. Uh, what do you, I had just two questions. One is who are those who are the, so what would you predict are going to be the challenges in the future? So like how do you think states or activists are going to try to challenge uh, nuclear production? And on the other hand, um, who are the main I, I, there's one primary lobby for nuclear power, isn't there, right now, or how does that operate? I don't think we have a primary lobby. The Nuclear Energy Institute does lobbying right. um, for us, um, which is a pretty large bit of their, um, their work. Right. But as far as challenges, we have challenges all the time by people uh, alleging that there's um, radiation leaking out. One of our um, opponents is just a private citizen up in the New York area. Kelly would probably recognize his name, which I won't mention. But uh, okay, well, I don't care. Either. But it, he claims that uh, it, our Indian Point plant is is poisoning him, and he says his wife got breast cancer because of our plant. And my question is. Move. Why aren't you, why are you still there? If we're killing you, move. I mean, his own actions belie his, his, own, his own program. But, and, but these people will throw up these spectral things that we've got to now go deal with. And so it imposes cost on us. And that's what we've seen in other places where they don't like nuclear power. Not in the South, so usually in the Northeast. They, they, and Kelly has mentioned a uh, um, cooling water problem we have at Indian Point. They want us to install two billion dollar cooling towers. Uh, it's probably more than that. Uh, which are each the size of Yankee Stadium. Two of those would be at the, and it would create plumes and would create other uh, problems like particulates and other such things. And not to mention having two giant uh, steam plumes in the area. Um, and we think it would violate air quality. It would, it would yeah. cause an air quality Handling problem. Them. But they know that. And the, the point is to shut them down. But what they don't do in their calculus is look at what is the opportunity cost for shutting these nuclear plants down. You've got to replace that generation with something else. And oftentimes it's with another generating source that causes much worse problems than a nuclear plant. What sort of uses are they thinking about for uh, nuclear waste in the future? Nobody's really thinking uh, too much about it right now. As I said, we're, we're looking to put it in a repository.
But the nuclear fuel has got um, most of the uranium-238 that started out the fuel is still there. Uh, a good deal of the U-235 is still there, and we have other fissionable isotopes in that fuel that could be harvested at such a point in time as it becomes economical to do so. Oh, Mr. Smith, we we'll get another class coming. Yeah. Hey, but we appreciate him coming out. Yeah, yeah right. Thank you. Hey, guys, grab some food on the way out if y'all want. We got plenty.